Well, as we gather together to worship on this Mother's Day, it's such a blessing to be with here with each of you, and so many of you have come to church today with your mother or grandmother. And I want to welcome you here this morning and invite you to turn with me in God's Word to the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3. This morning, we not only want to consider our mothers, but we want to consider womanhood in general. We want to consider what the Bible, God's Word, has to say about what a woman should be. So any woman here this morning, this message is for you. And men, this message is also for you because as you are, you have women in your life and many of the men here this morning are married and uh, you better be very careful uh, how you act on Mother's Day and make sure you take care of your wife and your mother this day. Um, this passage of Scripture is important for you as well. And so I pray that each of us this morning will see the significance of what the Bible has to say about womanhood this morning. The title of the sermon this morning is The Godly Woman. The Godly Woman. And we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1-7, through 7, but as we approach this passage of Scripture, I've been preaching out of Romans. And what is good about preaching through a book of the Bible is that you can pick up on one Sunday where you left off the Sunday before. Well, here we are, setting down straight in the middle of the book of 1 Peter, and we don't know what's been going on. You need to know that beginning in chapter 2, Peter, who is writing to a group of churches 2,000 years ago, he is writing to Christians, and he has been telling them about how they are to live their lives within the family and within society. And at the end of 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter gives instructions to those who were slaves. Now the Bible never condones slavery, but the Bible told slaves how they were to live as obedient Christians within the society that they were living in. And so in 1 Peter chapter 2, there were slaves that Peter writes to who were being mistreated and beaten. Listen to chapter 2, verse 18 of 1 Peter. Servants, this word means slaves. Be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and the gentle, but to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? There were slaves who were Christians that Peter is writing to who had been beaten. Peter says, but if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Now, listen to what Peter says to these Christians who were suffering as slaves. For to this you have been called. God called you to suffer in this way. Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds you have been healed for you were straying like sheep but you've now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls what peter has just said before we get to chapter 3 verse 1 to slaves is some of you are suffering unjustly under evil masters who would even beat you and this is a horrible thing However, God has called you to endure this suffering because Christ suffered for you. And you are to be willing to serve Christ even under suffering. God has called you to this so that you might follow in the steps of Jesus. And then Paul, uh, Peter excuse me, told us about how Jesus suffered for us. He paid for our sins when He died on the cross in our place. In His body, He bore our sins, and by His wounds we've been healed. We were once slaves to sin, but now we live in righteousness 
Peter said, this is what Christ has done for us. This is what Christ has done for the believer. He has freed us from sin and we have a new life in Jesus Christ. And we've seen this in the book of Romans as I've been preaching through it. Now in 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter begins to address the women in the congregation. And so if you're wondering when I'm going to get around to a Mother's Day sermon, now. Now the point <laughs> is this. We need to understand what Peter is doing. He is saying you live out your role as a Christian based upon the Gospel. You live as a man or a woman of God or as a child of God, meaning a, a, a young boy or girl living under his or her parents. You live as a Christian remembering what Christ has done for you and seeking to obey Christ. So when Peter says in chapter 3, verse 1, likewise, he is saying just as slaves suffer so that they might follow in Jesus' steps, chapter 2, verse 21, likewise, wives, you need to follow Jesus' example. Okay? Likewise, wives. That is, following Jesus' examples just like slaves had to do. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair or the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, Live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. Now going back to verse 1, we see what Peter is doing. He is addressing um, first slaves and then wives and then husbands. I find it interesting that when you look at Paul in the book of Ephesians chapter 5, Paul follows a similar pattern. He first addresses the role of the woman and then the role of the man. He talks to the wife and then he talks to the husband. Peter does the same. And I think it's appropriate that in our calendar we first observe Mother's Day and then Father's Day. So what we're going to do this Mother's Day and Father's Day is we're going to follow what Scripture has to say to mothers and fathers. What does it mean to be a godly woman? And then on Father's Day, I'll pick on the fathers. What does it mean to be a godly man? Now, the likewise of chapter 3, verse 1, we have noticed is that we are to follow Christ's examples. Women follow the example that Christ laid out. Likewise, wives follow in the steps of Jesus, chapter 2, verse 21. Likewise, be subject to your own husbands. Now, most translations will say submit to your own husbands. And you might be thinking to yourself, this preacher is suicidal, <laughs> preaching a text of the Bible on Mother's Day that talks about wives submitting to their own husbands. He's crazy. The only reason why we wouldn't want to look at this text on Mother's Day is if we misunderstand what the Bible means when it says to wives to submit to your own husbands. This is not a demeaning thing. This is a glorious thing. It, this is a gospel truth being laid out here in 1 Peter 3.1. When the Bible says, wives, be subject or submit to your own husbands, first you need to understand that the word that's being used here is a word that means to come under the authority of your husband. The word hupatasso in Greek. Come under the authority of... Follow the leadership of your husband. When the Bible talks about a wife submitting to her husband, what it means is, is that wives 
you should embrace the calling that God has given you in your family to follow the leadership of your husband. But this is not a demeaning thing at all. The same word is used in the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, to speak to the entire church. And it says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, Obey your leaders, that is, pastors, and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this without joy and not groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Now, the book of Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17 says to Christians to submit to the authority and leadership of the pastors. Now, does that somehow demean the rest of the congregation and subvert them under the authoritarian rule of the pastor? Not at all. Not at all. Peter had said in 1 Peter chapter 5 that, that pastors are to shepherd the church and not exercise dominion over them. Not, not to rule harshly over the church, but to love and lead and guide and shepherd the church. So the Bible uses the same word to speak of how a pastor should relate to the church in caring for the church, in nurturing the church, in feeding the church, in guiding the church, in loving the church. And husbands, you are called to pastor your home. You are to be a pastor to your wife and to your children. You may not have been called to shepherd the church, but every man who is married is called to shepherd his wife and his children, just as a pastor is called to shepherd the church. And the wife is to be willing to come under the authority of her husband as the shepherd in the home, so that the husband and wife will not be fighting with one another and arguing, but that there will be a loving relationship in which the husband leads and the wife is is pleased to follow her husband's godly leadership. You know, we hate to see when a church is fighting amongst itself and against a pastor. Church splits are an ugly thing. Well, so are family and marriage splits. It, it is a terrible thing when a husband and wife are fighting against one another. It's a terrible thing when a church and its pastor are fighting against one another. Now remember I told you that wives are to submit to their husbands following the example of Jesus. And you might say, well, Jesus never had to submit to anybody. He's God, right? Well, He is God. But He submitted to His own Father. Jesus submitted to His own Father. And I want to take you to the passage in Scripture which really defines what biblical submission of a wife to her husband in marriage is supposed to look like. You might think I would take you to Ephesians 5.22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. That is an excellent passage to talk about this. But I think the most important one that gives us the real meaning of why a wife should be willing to follow the leadership of her husband within the family and the home is given for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. Why is it that God has called the husband to be the head of the home and for the wife to be willing to follow his leadership as the leader and shepherd in the home? Because that's what Jesus did. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, Paul wrote these words, but I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. We as Christians have a duty to follow the leadership of Jesus Christ. Well, no one would argue with that. I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. That the head of a wife is her husband. And the head of Christ is God. Now when Paul refers to Christ and then to God in this context, he uses the word Christ to refer to God the Son and the word God to refer to God the Father. And what Paul is pointing out here is that the submission of the Christian to Christ, the submission of the wife to her husband, is based upon the Trinitarian relationship between the Father and the Son. Now if I lost you there, hear me. This is what 
marriage is about. Marriage is about the relationship between Christ and the church and the Father and the Son. When Jesus came down to this earth, He said to His disciples, I only do what I see My Father doing. Jesus said, I'm going to go back to heaven and one day I will return when the Father sends Me. Jesus always submitted to the authority of the Father. Jesus is God in human flesh, yet He always obeyed God the Father. Now listen to this. When Jesus was in the garden and He prayed in the garden of Gethsemane, let this cup pass from Me, Father, but not My will, but Yours be done. Jesus was submitting to the authority of His Father. Is Jesus any less God than God the Father? Absolutely not. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the three persons of the Godhead, are equal and they are one. And yet the Son submitted to the will of the Father in the garden and He said, Father, let not my will, but yours be done. Father, I'm going to follow your leadership and what you have called me to do. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3, Wives, you should be willing to follow your husband as the head of the home because Christ followed His Father as the head of the Godhead. So, going back to 1 Peter chapter 3, when our culture says that it is somehow demeaning when the Bible says to women that they are to submit to their husbands, That would also be to say that it is somehow demeaning that Christ obeyed His Father. If the woman being willing to submit to the authority of her husband in the home made her less of a person than her husband, then we would have to throw out the doctrine of the Trinity because the doctrine of the Trinity states that Christ is equal as God with the Father and yet He submits to the authority of His Father. You see, God created men and women equal, but He created them with different roles. And God called the man to lead and be the head of the home, but that is a position of service. When I get to pick on you, fathers, on Father's Day, we're going to look at how the Father is called to serve His wife. Jesus washed the feet of His disciples. And husbands, that's a model of how you're supposed to love your wife and care for your wife. Jesus said the greatest in the kingdom of heaven will be the least. So who is the leader within the home? The husband. And who is the least within the home? The husband. You're welcome, mothers. The point is this. That submission of the wife to her husband is not at all demeaning. And if we see it that way, we've misunderstood what the Bible teaches. This is based upon the truth, the eternal truth of the Godhead, where the Son submits to His Father and allows the Father to lead within the gospel plan of redemption for His people. And so wives, when you are willing to follow the leadership of your husband and when the church is willing to follow the leadership of her pastor, we are displaying to the world what Jesus did when He went to the cross in obedience to His Father. So marriage presents a wonderful gospel truth and the wife following the leadership of her husband gives the greatest illustration of what Jesus did when He went to that cross for you and me. And so don't dare think that's demeaning. Not at all. Not at all. And just because this culture tells us it is, well, this culture is wrong about a lot of things. But God's Word is the truth. And secondly, whereas our culture would say that wives should not submit to the leadership of the husband, of their husbands. Also, there are many who follow a different model, that somehow see the submission of, her, of a wife to her husband, meaning that the husband has some sort of strict authoritarian rule and, 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 and dominion over his wife. That's not at all true either. I don't know where the idea came from that women are to be seen and not heard, but I'll tell you this much, that's not in the Bible. 
Whereas some would read the Bible when it says that wives are to submit to their husband and they think that somehow that means a woman is not to speak and not to be seen and all those sorts of things and somehow is subjected under her husband. Those who read the Bible in that way, they're just wrong. Some people used to read the Bible and thought that it condoned slavery. And those people were wrong too. Some people had read the Bible and thought that somehow the woman is to be placed under her husband and the husband is supposed to boss his wife around and treat her as if he is less than her. Those who interpret the Bible that way, they're just wrong. The father didn't do that to his son and the husband does not do that to his wife. So let us take the biblical approach which sees submission of the wife to her husband as her being willing to follow the leadership of her husband. Not in any way demeaning her, but presenting the gospel to this lost and dying world. Your marriage is the greatest illustration of the gospel that God has given to this world. And your home is as well. So let us be willing to display that. Now, what, what does a wife do if her husband is not the man of God that he's been called to be? It's easy to submit, submit to a godly husband. What, what about an ungodly husband? Wives, be subject to your own husbands so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. The truth is, is that oftentimes the woman is the person in the home who has the closest relationship to God and not the man. And that is a sad truth. Generally speaking, as I observe things in America, women are more faithful in attending church than men. It's just the way things are in America today. And just as Adam forsook his leadership in the garden, just as Adam failed and when Adam and Eve sinned together, God came to Adam and said, Adam, where are you? I'm going to hold you responsible for what you and Eve did together because Adam as the head of his home, bore the responsibility for the sin in the garden. So many husbands are derelict in their duty the way that Adam was in the garden and do not lead. So what does a wife do when her husband is not a believer? Or even worse, when her husband lives a very ungodly lifestyle. Wives, be subject or submit to your own husband so that even if some do not obey the word, so that even if some are unbelievers and even if they have some big sin in their lives, that they might be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. For those women who are married to a man that is not following Jesus Christ. Peter says here that you are the greatest evangelist that God has placed into your husband's life. You have an opportunity to, to win him to Christ like no one else. Live with him, being willing to follow his leadership insofar as that does not cause you to disobey Christ. You're not supposed to follow your husband off a cliff. When a husband gives poor leadership, you follow Christ. But love your husband. Don't fight against him. Love him. Even if he's not the man that God has called him to be, as he should. So that he might be one without a word. One to salvation in Christ without a word. By the conduct of his wives, when he, when he, of his wife, when he sees your respectful and pure conduct. When he sees your godly life, he will recognize that he is not the man that God has called him to be. So does a Christian woman have to submit to an ungodly man? Yes, but only insofar as she is not disobeying Christ. She should be willing to follow his leadership, but first follow the leadership of Christ. That's why Paul says, wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord, because ultimately you're submitting to God, not your husband. Ultimately, you're following the leadership of God, not your husband. And so, of course, you only follow the leadership of your husband as you can do so in obedience to the Lord. We see the example of the godly woman in verses 2 and 3. And then in verses 
3 to 4, we see the beauty of the godly woman. Look at the beauty of the godly woman in verses 3 and 4. Peter commands all the women in the church, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair or the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. We live in a culture that objectifies women. We live in a culture that encourages women to treat themselves as if they exist merely for the visual viewing pleasure of the world around them. That is not so. That is not how God intended it. That is a gross distortion of what God intended a woman's beauty to be and how her beauty should be displayed. Do not let your adorning, that is, do not let the way that you show your beauty, woman of God, be the braiding of hair. Now, does this mean you can't braid your hair? No. But don't let your hairstyle show your beauty. Don't let your adorning be the putting on of gold jewelry. Does that mean you shouldn't wear gold jewelry? No. That means don't let you try to show off your beauty through jewelry. You can wear jewelry, but don't let that be the way you display who you are in Christ. Don't let your beauty be wrapped up in your image. Remember what Proverbs 31 verse 30 said in our scripture reading this morning. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Charm and beauty pass with time. Young woman, you're not always going to look like that. I'm just going to be honest with you. Your beauty better be wrapped up in more than your face. Your beauty, Peter says, the adorning not, should not be in the clothes you wear or your jewelry or your hair. But verse 4, let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart. Your inner beauty, woman of God, that is what you should display to the world around you. And that beauty doesn't fade. You will not always look the same on the outside. But you can only grow more and more beautiful on the inside if you're a woman of God and you're following Jesus Christ. Let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. He uses a word here, very precious, meaning that which is expensive or costly. And what Peter is doing is he is saying, while women typically want costly clothing and jewelry and hairstyles, the value that they should be desiring is the costly beauty of the heart, which comes through following Jesus Christ, which was paid for by the blood of Jesus on the cross when He died for your sins and rose from the grave and gave you new life. The really expensive beauty of a woman is that she is a woman of God who was bought by the blood of Jesus on the cross and purchased. She belongs to Him and she lives for Christ. That is the kind of value that the woman of God displays to the world. Not the value of her jewelry or her clothing, but the value of what Christ did for her and how He changed you from the inside out. The beauty of your heart. Then in verses 5 and 6, we've seen the example of the godly woman and the beauty of the godly woman. Now we see the heritage of the godly woman. Verses 5 and 6, Peter says, For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Now Sarah followed the leadership of Abraham. And if you read Genesis chapter 12 and 20 especially, you will find that Abraham often had very poor leadership within his home. I won't go into the story, but let's just say that Abraham was one of those husbands that often ended up putting his foot in his mouth and making big, big mistakes. And yet Sarah still loved him and followed him. 
She even called him Lord, meaning she was willing to follow him when his leadership sometimes was questionable. She didn't follow him into sin, but she still loved him. She didn't turn against her husband, even when he made a mistake. Wives, we husbands, we mess up. So be gracious with us. We often don't live up to what God has called us, to who God has called us to be in Christ. So be gracious with us. Sarah was willing to follow Abraham, even though he was imperfect, far from it. You are Sarah's children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Sarah, she was taken into Pharaoh's harem. She was going to be made Pharaoh's wife because Abraham was afraid in Genesis 12 that Pharaoh might kill me to have my wife, so I'll just say she's my sister, and then Pharaoh won't kill me. Husbands, it's a bad idea if someone asks you if you're married to say, no, I'm not married, I'm single. That's what Abraham did. Big mistake. Big mistake. And yet Sarah still loved him after that tremendous mistake. And then bad enough, he does the same thing again in Genesis chapter 20. He was not a perfect husband. But Sarah was not afraid of that which was frightening. That which would normally intimidate and cause fear in the heart of most women. Why? Because Sarah's trust and hope was not in Abraham. Sarah's trust and hope was in her husband. Excuse me, in God, not her husband. She was trusting that the Lord would bring her through. Even when Abraham messed up, Sarah knew that God was in control. And she stuck by her husband's side even when he failed. And that is how a woman of God lives even when her husband is not living up to the man that God has called him to be. Just like a slave who is being mistreated by his master still has to follow Christ. Still, even though life is difficult and hard and he's suffering, he still follows Christ. So a wife whose husband is not being the man of God he should be, the wife still follows Christ and trusts in the Lord. Now in verse 7. Here we have a Mother's Day command to you men. So men, if you're asleep, wake up before we go home. We need to hear what Peter has to say to us men and how we are to treat our wives. Pay attention on this Mother's Day. Verse 7, Likewise, husbands, here's how you are to follow the example of Christ. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Live with your wives in an understanding way. Live with them according to knowledge, it says. According to the knowledge of who your wife is in Christ and who you are in Christ, husbands. Live a gospel marriage that displays the beauty of God's love for His Son and Christ's love for His church. Just as Paul told husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church, so husbands, you are to live with your wives with the knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ and that your home and your marriage is about the gospel and it is about something much greater than yourself. So live with them with this knowledge, understanding who you are called to be in Christ and who that woman of God is in Christ and how precious she is. Show her honor. She's worthy of that honor. Show honor to her as the weaker vessel. Now what does he mean by weaker vessel? This is a word that refers to physical strength. It doesn't mean she's not as intelligent. It doesn't mean that she doesn't have the moral or courageous fortitude of the man but that she simply does not have the physical strength of the man. And God intended it that way so that the husband would almost have to take up leadership because his wife would need him as the physically stronger one to take up that leadership, to fight in battle, to fix things when they're broken, to do those physical tasks that the man is called to do. Show her honor as the weaker vessel, since they, your wife, 
since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Did you hear that, husbands? You don't honor your wife and treat her well, your prayers will be hindered. You want to know how upset God is with you when you don't treat your wife well? He's not going to listen to your prayers. He loves your wife more than you ever could. He died for your wife on a cross. So honor her and love her for the woman of God that she is because she is a precious gift to you from the Lord. And so is your mother and your grandmother and your daughter. They are precious gifts from God. And as we love one another within our marriages, within our families, within our homes, we are to show the world the love that Christ had for us when he died on that cross and rose from the grave. That is what your marriage is about. That is what your home is about. That is what this church is about. And on this Mother's Day, we celebrate these women of God because we want to worship God and thank Him for this tremendous gift. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank You for Your Word and I thank You for each one that's gathered here today. Father, we not only thank You for the women that You have placed into our lives, but we thank You for the Gospel by which You saved every one of us who trust in Christ. And for those here today, whether man or woman, who do not know Christ, we ask that as the gospel has been presented clearly to them, that you would call them to faith and repentance. And that those here today who have not yet surrendered to Christ would turn from their sin and place their faith and their hope in Christ, just like Sarah did. And to trust in you, to be saved by grace, to receive the glorious eternal life that you've given us in the gospel. Lord, if there is one here today that does not know Christ, we ask that you would save them by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.